Hello and uh, welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join us for another scintillating half hour of uh, discussion and, uh, and turmoil about the issues of the day, both locally and at the state level. Joining me uh, in this episode, uh, Ken Risto, who is the coordinator and the director no. of the Department of Social Studies for the Sheboygan Area School District no. or something vaguely like something that. Something like that, yes. Tom Pineski, much nice easier, yeah. professor of mathematics, UW Sheboygan, former state senator Cal Potter, and former assistant state librarian for the Department of Public Instruction. I didn't get that quite right either. No, but that's okay. You're but close. it's close. It's close. It's close. Yeah, it's about Me? I'm just a humble lawyer. <laughs> country, country Counselor lawyer. law. Right. We've got a lot to get through I've here. I've seen so. an expensive pages in the Sheboygan Press. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we ask for no free publicity. So, uh, But that brings us to... We had an interesting episode with uh, Scott Mielif, the uh, project, uh, I got his title wrong too. Whatever Scott does here. He's not uh, social studies coordinator. He is not, that much we know. Um, and he's probably gonna He could very well be by now. the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's see how this goes. And we have a lot to talk about, but we just wanna say that uh, we had a very good uh, discussion with Scott about uh, public access TV and uh, the perceived and I think actual threat to the continuation of programming like this. Um, at the state level, and uh, if in fact that bill has not been voted on by the time you're viewing this program, what we forgot to say in the last uh, program was uh, legislators do listen to their constituents, and if you have concerns about significant restrictions on, on access to programming like this, you should definitely be in touch with your, with your uh, representatives in the city of Sheboygan, Terry Van Akron, uh, State Senator Joe Leibham, and I don't think Steve Castell would be not in, in the city, but even not in, in this the area city, around right? Area. And yeah. and Dan Lemahue. So, food for thought. Now let's move on to other election news. We're taping this quite a bit of time after the uh, city election. Uh, the um, uh, common council elections, I think, were most interesting. Um, I think we all did relatively well on our prognostications, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Jim Gisha won. I think we, and that was a close race. I think we all agreed uh, it would be close, and it was. Uh, Corey Bauk won uh, a commanding uh, victory, really, over Lyle Vanderweist. I was wrong about that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think Lyle was uh, pretty much a class act. Uh, yeah. I think he ran a, a gracious, and, and, and I think they both did. They both were class acts. They, yes, they, they, they were. really so they had, were. Whoever won is going to represent that district well. I know. So, so I, I think we were, we were, uh, we're well served, and I'm in that district, so I, I, and, and both of them are my neighbors, so uh, they're both pretty nice guys. Uh, Danver Hassel commandingly won uh, over Dimple Adams. Um, uh, Joe, uh, not Joe, yes, Joe Heidenreiter. Heidemann. 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 I beg your pardon, Joe. Heidemann. Joseph. Joseph um, won, again, a pretty commanding uh, victory over nice. Jim Groff. I think we both, or all of us, rather predicted that. Bill Wangeman, uh Schwetzt, uh, Jeff Radke, I think we all predicted that. And uh, <clears throat> the Meyer Tyshinsky um, uh, dust up was a little, was a close. little closer. Um, it wasn't close, but it was certainly closer than the, uh, than the other two races that were highly contested. But uh, Vicki Meyer, uh, it was about 51, 52% of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, the committee assignments have been made, uh, voted on 15, or 15 to one or 14 to 1 um, at the last council meeting. So what do you think? Tom, you were on the council, a good group this time? I don't know. I think the, the all, I mean, I, I actually went to the council proceedings for the opening night ceremony. You did. And, and uh, I start counting uh, how many years of experience. This person, zero. This person, zero. This person, zero. This person, one year. <coughs> this person, one year. <laughs> I got to, somebody had, uh, I think Marilyn Montemeyer had six years and... Uh, Gene Kittleson has been around maybe a little bit, but... Uh, two years, three years, yeah. uh, two years. Richard and, uh, Manny's been on quite and a long Manny time. And uh, uh, Silas. Silas. Van Silas, Van about six years. So that's a young council, so mm -hmm. I haven't... And, and Mark Hanna is mm -hmm. only in his second year, right. who's now mm -hmm. uh, head of finance. Vicki Meyer starting her... Second, third, second third, term. Third Just year. second term. Yeah, yeah second third year. Third year. So it's a young group, yeah. and it'll so I don't know how it'll shake out, but uh, they've got a lot of energy, so we'll see. Yeah, it'll be, mm -hmm. uh, I think it'll be an interesting group. So um, the, um, 
and I will say I was down at uh, the administration building as votes were coming in, and it was nice to see the um, Oosberg referendum pass um, by a, f a fair margin. So I thought I thought and that was Sheboygan good. Sheboygan Falls is both both of their referendum yeah. passed, right. referenda passed as well, uh, but not Plymouth. Spending. But not Plymouth. Plymouth has got a rough road to hoe because yep. schools <clears> under <throat> these revenue caps. Uh, I mean, you just can't can't really keep up unless you mm -hmm. <clears throat> figure out other things to do, none of which are, are particularly pleasant. Um, just in the um, uh, talking about uh, Sheboygan, I think it's fair to say that um, the Sheboygan Press editorial, I think, before the election had identified, um, had called the slate of candidates, at least to some extent, candidates that were either retired police officers or sympathetic to the police. Um, they did not do well. Uh, other than uh, Bill Wangeman, uh, none of those candidates won. Um, any significance in that? No? I mean, they were running against other good candidates, so I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the message I thought as I watched was that um, the electorate wanted to put people on the board, uh, or on the, on the council rather, that would be really coming, I think, with an open mind and be willing to work productively with other people. And we talked about it before the election that uh, several of the candidates who were running were affiliated with the recall effort and they were defeated. I think people wanted to move on from that. Um, I think they were looking to put people on that are going to accomplish something and, and be more civil toward one another. And. I talked to some folks around the community, and some of those who watch the um, some of the candidate forums on Channel Eight, um, you it's a small town, and you can identify who the speakers are and who the folks are. And there was, I think, a sort of a, a kind of a quiet resentment about the fact that some of the police were there at some of the forums, asking pretty pointed questions. And, and there's some people really are having some questions about the appropriateness of that. I think everybody supports the police. They know it's a difficult job. It's not getting any easier. Sheboygan's becoming more diverse. We've certainly got gang issues and, and drug issues in the community, and I think people support their police, but they're not quite willing to let them write a blank check yet or let them do what they want to do. Um, and I think people just have a general notion that the uh, public servants have more than ample opportunities within their departments and they have ample communication lines that they don't need to come to forums. I think the same thing would be true if a bunch of teachers showed up at a school board meeting and and yabbered on and yabbered on and talked and talked and talked too and said, you know, the citizenry, the general citizenry, the general taxpayers should have those opportunities. So I think there was sort of a, a sense that um, while we're willing to support the police and, and so give them the resources they need to do the job, um, we're not necessarily really buying into this idea that um, they're really being shortchanged right now. Mm -hmm. So, I think the, the finance department has a should, it came under a little bit of scrutiny yeah. prior to the election, and you've got Jim Gisha, Corey Bauk, uh, Jim Boren, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Hanna. Uh, so it's, if there's a, a trend, it's toward getting people with some business acumen on the council, yes. and that's going to then change how. And it maybe you need somebody with a little more just instead of working in a bank or a business, some kind of mm -hmm. finance industry, you need a person of another ilk. To kind of balance, but right now it's moving toward the business kind of, right. which is maybe it's due, maybe it's time. And to I, a certain degree, you're seeing that on the school board as well. Is you? that um, there are more male faces, first of all, and, and maybe that's because of this business orientation. But there's overall just have been a general drift toward a more and more business orientation uh, perspective than maybe another point of view. That being said, I think businessmen who get involved in government workings find that they're two really significantly different spheres. Oh, yeah. and, and the reason for that is, you know, quite frankly, it's taxpayers' money. It's not the money that you brought into the coffers from last month's sale. And, and that, you can't do what you want to do. I mean, you go into business, you yep. do what you want to do. Here you've got state laws, you've got local regulations, Regions. you've got interest groups, you've oh, got, yes. you know, all kinds of, well, federal laws included. There are a lot of parameters that all of a sudden you have to meet. Yeah, so and I they think, cost money in most cases. Yeah, and I think so. I think businessmen coming into government, particularly if it's their first, you know, swing at it, um, mm. it's a new world. I remember, oh, I think it was back in the early '90s. A couple of business people got on the school board because they were going to change the way the school board mm. did business, and 
they didn't last real long. I, I think their level of frustration about being able to affect significant change as you can in a private business mm -hmm. uh, just isn't there. Um, that being said, it does not, I think having an entrepreneurial spirit and business mm -hmm experience and acumen is incredibly important and really just shines a different light and always having smart people I think you know willing to to serve their local governmental units or state whatever is 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 pretty key to the democracy yeah, they, they ask a lot of times they come right what's it going to cost <laughs> or, or what's the effect on the cost <laughs> or what's the effect on this instead of well it's a consumer oriented kind of project or a What's it going to cost? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. They're bottom line oriented. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And always willing to, um, my, my pet peeve in, in, in government services, people come up with terrific solutions, and yet when you ask what the problem is that the solution is addressing, yes. <laughs> people are hard pressed to tell you what the problem is. They're entranced with the solution, but mm -hmm. what problem? Well. In any event, That's a good point. I do, I do uh, digress. Um, it, along the lines of, of whether or not there's enough money, the Sh uh, Greater Sheboygan Committee, I think it is, delivered what they called a white paper to City Hall uh, regarding uh, police spending and budget figures and, and so forth. And I thought Chief Kirk made a good point that it, it's very difficult to tell if the budget in one city which may be more or less than in another city is really apples to apples or, or whatever mm -hmm. and so some I, have paramedics and some don't and all the different roles and right. the way you structure your department yeah. in many cases. I have not seen the white paper, <clears throat> uh, any of you? No. No, I'm not sure. Yeah. No. Um, so I don't know, I can't really speak to, to, to the document, but I think it's an excellent discussion to have and because the, the police budget has gone up pretty steeply in the last 10 years fire somewhat, public works has gone down, and other, other budget lines have remained pretty, pretty much right along the, the bottom. So it is a question of determining, you know, in a Sheboygan that's not like it was when we were growing up in the 50s, um, or some of us maybe even later than that. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it is a different world. So we'll, uh, we'll What about the school board election? What did you think of that? Um, I have to say, I, uh, Fong Lee was at the administration building uh, the entire time the votes were coming in, and um, I like Fong. I had met him <coughs> at, a, at just a meet and greet kind of gathering, and uh, he's very bright, and I thought he ran a wonderful campaign. I, you know, he worked very hard. He had signs all around. He had supporters sending out these great big orange postcards. Um, and it was kind of heartbreaking as the night went on just because he started out with a lead and then, you know, it just gradually diminished and then, and then flipped. Um, I'm disappointed. Um, I, I think the city and the school district is well served by having diverse people on its board because we have a very diverse school district. We have also a very large Hmong population <clears throat> that should be reflected very much so in the decision. Exactly, sure. exactly. Well, I, wish, I hope he runs again. Uh, I think yeah, he will. I, mean, I think he you, will too. You have a you needed name recognition, and now mm -hmm. they know you know starting to get to know who he is. You run yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I you know while the tape is running, you know the last what four episodes I I said that that Fong Lee was not going to have any problem winning. So. So we'll, we talk we'll not about, listen you know, to you again. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I was yeah. pretty good about the aldermanic <laughs> races, alderwoman races, but boy, was I off. I mean, and I still um, find it absolutely mind-boggling that a person who can get, what, 60 votes in an aldermanic primary can all of a sudden turn around and, and get elected only several months later, not even, what, two months later? Less than that, uh, to a, a school board uh, seat. Well, it was and interesting. I don't know. I was I was watching the you know I saw the returns too and and Fong did very very well in the city, reasonably well in the city. But in the outlying areas, uh, the town of Wilson, the town of Sheboygan, there all of a sudden Scott Lewandowski had support for whatever reason. He certainly I don't think he I know he doesn't live there. Uh, I don't know if he's got lots of relatives out in these areas that are running for him. Um, and quite honestly, the pink elephant in the table. Um, as I talked to, I bet you I've talked to about 50, 60 people trying to figure out how could I get this so wrong, you know. Because um, he finds it so hard to believe that he well, got Well, I get things wrong, wrong but I usually can figure out why I got it wrong, and I couldn't figure out why I got this wrong. And people, you know, of all sorts of walks in life just felt flat out said, people aren't ready to vote for a Hmong candidate. And I think 
you know, nobody wants to hear that, and I'm sure that's not going to be well received by some people, but uh, I felt, I felt uh, really disappointed in the results because I, I just didn't see, um, as I watched the candidate forums, I didn't see Scott and um, you know, the voters have spoken and we're going to work with Scott and Scott hopefully will make a contribution to the board and, and I just didn't see him articulating a vision or that was that compelling uh, compared yeah. to what's, what, what, what Justin, doing. I don't want to take up more time, but was there a, a, a TV, did TV8 do a forum or did anybody do a forum for the school board candidates and then have it tele, <clears throat> televised so people could watch? I don't think so. No, no. And and that's really too bad because because Scott, that's how I got to see Corey Bauk. Or the second, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. know who the guy was, and mm -hmm. I watched yeah. him on the forum, and I thought, well, oh, this guy's pretty nice. And same with the other guy. Mm -hmm. I thought mm -hmm. they're both good. Yeah. But that was based on the watching, yeah. watching. Because you'll remember we had a contested election for the townies too. Um, Jeff Squire, Mark Mansell, and Al Yanti were running for two spots. Right. And yeah. Jeff Squire and Mark Mansell, who are current incumbents, you know, one. You know, one well. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the comfortable, the comfortable right. mar margins, and, and Al Yanti uh, did not do particularly well. And uh, but that's a that's a something to think about for the future because so I think see who who the person is because there right. are a lot of issues. And in fact, I personally was delighted when I was on the school board. We were on the front page. It seemed every other day, and I haven't seen the school board on the front page for a long time. So, dear school board members, <laughs> I was delighted to see right <laughs> on the. Uh, Slightly above the fold, school board considers new procedures to communicate. And so there's going to be a new policy within six weeks. I think there was a flap about a portable gymnastics floor. And, uh, but uh, okay. maybe this is the beginning of the school board just kind of coming back into the public eye. Well, the, that was, when you read the article, and I, I don't have much discussion, even though I'm at South part of the day, um, what that was all about. But... Uh, what was what was portrayed in the Sheboygan press made it look like the Keystone Cops. I mean, you had a superintendent who didn't know that a floor was being a fifteen thousand dollar floor was being purchased. Uh, you've got a business director who was spending money with the idea that he was going to get compensated by uh, some private funds that were going to be raised, but that money hadn't been given to him yet. You've got a Phi Ed department who's supposed to use that facility, and they didn't even, they, according to them anyway, they were never told that this was even in the works. Um, everybody's scurrying around and trying to avoid responsibility here for whatever it is that's going on. I don't know what it means to have a change in, in uh, communication policies. You know, one of the Maybe things that... performance would have been a better word. Well, I don't, I don't know what that means. Know. I really don't know what that means because, you know, the, the FIA department at South High School, in fact, did send a letter to the superintendent's office. They kind of went through the chain of command, as it were, letting the superintendent at least have the courtesy of knowing they were going to make the board aware of something that they were concerned about. And um, as it just turned out, he was out, out of town on vacation, and, and um, you just the rule is or the policy or practice is you don't put stuff into board packets for them to be aware of unless the superintendent signs off. <laughs> And so it got delayed. Which is and, okay. I, I, you know, on his toes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, but it, it really raises the the you know the really raises the question: Are you going to change the policy and procedures, or what change would that involve? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us at any given time, as you know, citizens, pick up the telephone and, and talk to all school board members uh, if we have issues and concerns, formally or informally. Um, you know, well, some people may not want that. They may want their teachers to, you know, keep information channeled into pipelines, and, and uh, but that's just not going to happen. And we should just take a little poll informally among ourselves that when I introduce Ken during our next episode, whether it'll be the former coordinator <laughs> of, of social studies. Well, you know, the, the reality is we don't call it this way, but we're, I'm tenured, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, if they want to send me back to South High full time and not have me at Central, they, that's I've always been. Uh, I've always I've always said I serve at the pl as a pleasure of the superintendent of public schools and yes. and well, the assistant. So in any event, this has been a bracing conversation. <laughs> well, it's it, it's just one of those things where. Um, you know, it, the, nobody looked good. Nobody looked good in the process. The first rule of holes is that when you're in one, you should stop digging. So I don't and, consider and, myself in a hole, <laughs> so I don't consider myself digging. It's just you know, I'm I'm moving right along. If we if we have just a little bit Let's of time to, hole. To, <laughs> yeah. to cover to cover state news, and I think there's some interesting stuff. Just gratifying to me because I was horrified at the Georgia Thompson verdict. Um, it seemed to be. 
the thinnest of evidence. This is the, um, the travel gate, as it were, of the uh, state of Wisconsin. Georgia Thompson responsible for awarding a state of Wisconsin travel contract, which was lucrative. It's $75 million. I, can it be that much? Mm, I don't know, but it was it some was millions. High, but I don't know if it was that high. Yeah, but, some millions of dollars yeah. um, to the uh, Edelman Travel Agency. And um, it was, to me, clearly a political prosecution. Um, and for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in oral argument to say that the evidence was beyond thin, and from a legal perspective for the Court of Appeals to release her. And it was a conservative court, too. Well, and, and, and uh, Judge uh, Easterbrook, uh, who's the chief judge of the Seventh Circuit, who is incredibly bright and incredibly conservative, wrote the opinion, which was not as dramatic as the... Um, as the, uh, the oral argument testimony about the evidence being beyond thin. That's not in the written opinion. The written opinion is fascinating, though, just in terms of how you interpret what political action is within the context of awarding contracts and so forth, and the inf what we mean by political influence and so forth. So if you have a chance to read the opinion, because you may not agree with him all the time, but I mean, he's, he's a pretty bright guy. <laughs> I would like to be about it. This, Tenth, as, as bright as he is. So I was just gratified because I thought this woman really, really, really was treated poorly and did spend four months in jail. You know, Scott Jensen. Well, lost is, her job, lost her reputation. Oh, and all because of some hundreds of thousands, shenanigans. hundreds no, of thousands of dollars. This was a court trial, right? It was a trial to the jury. To a jury, and the judge who adjudicates the process or who works apparently allowed the testimony to go forward, so sure. I thought it was not thin, or at least if sufficient enough to go forward, and the jury said yes. And that's why, and, and we were just all scratching our heads, it was like, how, how, on the evidence that was presented, could you possibly allow a jury to reach that, that, that verdict? I asked my husband, I said, can't a judge overturn a verdict? And he said, well, you, a judge could, but yes. it's very, sure. very, very rare, <clears throat> so at least, at least the process in the Seventh Circuit went relatively quickly, but I just point out Scott Jensen is still free on bail because Judge Faust allowed him, while this kind of protracted sure. appeal is going on, um, he's still free, and yet this woman was, I mean, I was upset. And so I feel vindicated, which happens so seldom these days that I must say I'm I, I like it. what Cal just said, though, just five minutes, three minutes earlier. It was a conservative court. See? Yes. Conservative courts, you, you could trust them. Well, <laughs> well, they, <laughs> but they looked at the world stage here, and the world stage is that Biskubic, the prosecutor, was on the list that Gonzalez had to get rid of because he wasn't uh, Republican enough and not getting, you know, prosecuting oh. certain cases. And he redeemed himself very admirably by uh, kicking this woman in the butt and getting her fired, literally yeah, but, from her job. No, Biskubic at the time, you know, according to him, though, he wasn't even aware he was on a list. Yeah, no. but he was. And, and yeah, well, he was. I mean, and he was attorneys off. are and, political and, animals, and, well, and that's and, and okay. The judges, oh, and the judges, I looked at, <laughs> the judges oh. looked at the scene. Now here you got Gonzalez lying through his teeth to Congress. Now you're finding out what is it, papers today is saying that Karl Rove is up to his eyeballs in, in this whole thing as well, giving orders to people. No. And, uh, <laughs> Good you know. <laughs> so we'll, we'll let Tom weigh so in So we've here. got, uh, you know, we've got a court who's saying, you know, this thing looks like a setup, folks. Evidence is thin, but look what's all being, look, all these munions and dark shadows out here. Uh, there's got to be something better for this woman than being the poster child for uh, victory well, but I think the, for the, these I think characters. the important point here is that normally court of appeals remand things back to retrial exactly. because of yeah. procedural yeah. issues or where the process wasn't properly taken care of. This was... Rare. Rare, where they Rare. actually overturn a jury verdict based upon the facts presented. And order immediate release. Yeah, that, that, that's I think she was stunning. out of jail the next day. That's stunning. It does, that just doesn't happen that often. Particularly with Judge Easterbrook. I mean, yeah. so, yeah. uh, so I, th I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so. and understandably, judges are loath to overturn jury verdicts. That's why we have juries. Well, that's why we impanel them and, and we entrust them to, to f determine facts. But it shows juries oh, wow. make mistakes. Oh, sure. Sometimes the jury, in the choosing of juries, you get people who who have a mindset that, well, obviously, mm -hmm. if they're in court and we have a case, they must be guilty. There are people who have that yeah. mindset. And yeah. so I'm sure that was part of why the jury felt uh, compelled to make a decision uh, in 
accusing her or convicting her of, of this heinous crime. Was it know? a Dane County jury? Uh, no. So. no? Uh, I'm just wondering because you Rudy know. Rudy Rand is in the Eastern District. Okay. Isn't he? I'm just it wondering was Judge where, Randa. when I the jury was, was in panel, where th the, what community uh, the yeah. trial took place. But okay. Biscupic is in the is in the Western District, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In any event, um, having done a number of jury trials myself over the years, you just realize that it is difficult to predict what's going yeah, to happen, sure. and, uh, and that's the beauty and the frustration of the system. But yeah. at least in this case, I think justice the was done. Worked. Sure. And uh, she may have spent four months in prison, but um, she's back, she's getting back, she's back paid, at her desk. So she's getting yeah. paid for uh, yeah. her unpleasant yeah. experience. Yeah. One of the neat things that I think that our Wisconsin lawmakers, Feingold and Cole, are working on is the extension of senior care through 2009. And I believe they have gotten, uh, the program is set to end June 30th, and I think there is, um, uh, my mom was on senior care, and it's a wonderful program. Yes. It's simple. Um, the application was only a page long. The two of us could do it together without, you know, tearing our hair out. Um, it seemed to be very well accepted by the pharmacy, and she was taking a lot of medication in her last couple of years. Um, I have not talked to seniors who have been dealing with with Medicare D, but um, it seems to me it's a terrific program. And why wouldn't why wouldn't the federal government want to keep that allow a, allow Wisconsin to keep an efficient cost-effective uh, program in place. I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm hoping that, that senior care is extended because I do think that it's, that it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it's going to happen, though. Yeah. Um, it looks like, at best, Wisconsin may get an extension until the end of the year. Yeah, uh, that's... Mm -hmm. I know there's some discussion about that rather than the June 30th deadline you mentioned, and then everybody is going to have to go to uh, Medicare Part D in Wisconsin if they're currently under uh, Badger Care. Yeah. I have several friends of mine whose parents are on Badger Care, and, uh, and again, they, they speak nothing but good things about the program. It is simple. It's, well, it's really, really relatively straightforward. Senior care. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, senior care. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you really, if you're in Medicare, the, the prescription Part D program, uh, you really need, for a lot of senior citizens, you better have somebody who really knows Mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing. My parents were fortunate that, uh, and I plug Burkhard Heisdorf here, I guess, but they, they, they went and they really got excellent advice. They looked at what the medications are being taken and looked at all the various plans and were able to give my parents some really sound advice that I, I'm sure they would have been very difficult to do if they had to do it by themselves. We've got just a minute left. Um, do you see any change in the Wisconsin legislature, how it's doing business, and now that we have a, a Senate that is democratic and where things are a little bit more balanced? Well, they passed one of the uh, bills dealing with the merging of the ethics and the yeah. board and the elections board. Uh, the campaign finance thing is is a, is a anybody's guess. I mean, the, the, this, the further we go down the road of collecting these thousand dollar checks from AT and T and so on, uh, those apps somebody's going to say, "I'm a guilty person. I need to repent, and I wouldn't want a new campaign finance system." You know, that's the problem with the passage of yeah. time. Uh, Trying to do that with Ziegler. We'll see what happens, and we have to say goodbye. <laughs>